as you've heard us mention, this fiscal cliff, as they call it, is coming in just a few weeks. And as of January the 1st, a lot of people's taxes are going to go up. The average family, $220 a year or more, depending on how much they make, of course, but it's going to be a big hit to many, many people. And our, our whole nation is going to be very greatly hit if they don't do something big. And yet the president and the Congress are wrangling and wrangling, and it's the whole democratic system what will your people go along with? Well, I don't know. Well, what will your people go along with? Well, let's see what our backers want, and let's see what our people will put up with, and so on. And they wrangle, and they fight, and they compromise, and sometimes they don't even compromise. They just bullheadedly go ahead and make the wrong decisions, often based on politics. And so many experts, and you've read it in the headlines of your paper probably several times, at this point, our national debt or our national uh, debt is going to go up $1.6 trillion over the next 10 years. Or that taxes, I should say, are going to go up $1.6 trillion uh, over the next 10 years. And our current total indebtedness as a nation, this is a figure you don't often hear, but I've read it four or five times in different publications. So they estimate, this is a rough estimate, but they estimate that when you include the federal debt the state debt, the local debts of the various parts of the government, we are 222, it's easy to remember, $222 trillion in debt, that is as of debt and as of promised benefits over the next several years. That is a figure hard to get your mind around. But the main thing, brethren, we do need to understand, and very few people understand that number, of course, but most experts recognize that unless a drastic change in our entire way of life is made, the United States is going bankrupt as a nation, and we're going down and out. And Almighty God said back in Leviticus 26, verse 19, because of our sins, he said, I will break the pride of your power. And certainly the two biggest emblems of the pride of our power have been our financial power, the so-called American wealth and way of life, and our military power. And of course, Osama bin Laden knew that, so he attacked the big symbol of our national power in Washington, in New York City with the Twin Towers, and the military power by attacking the Pentagon in Washington, D.C the two biggest symbols of American power. They are going down more than most of you realize. You brethren here and you brethren around the world who may be hearing this, I say more than most of you realize because God has called me and some of those assisting me to be the watchman. And we do have hours to go over the news, think about it, talk about it, analyze it, and that is our responsibility. And we can see that our nation is headed for much more than just a fiscal cliff we're certainly going over a massive cliff in about 10 different ways if we don't change our whole way of life, spiritually, financially, and in many other ways. And we won't dwell on that today, but certainly it's time for us to wake up. What's the reason for that, the real underlying reason beside the fact we've turned away from God? We have wrong government. We have a government where people argue, they fight, they bicker, they don't turn to God and ask for guidance, and they generally do the wrong thing. And we're going down the tubes unless we repent. And our whole message that we're talking about on the Tomorrow's World telecast, and in our magazine, and in our campaigns that we're having, and our services, you know, is what? The gospel of the kingdom of God. And Mr. Armstrong taught us, which is certainly true, the word kingdom means government. We're preaching, brethren, a coming government of God. And unless that government comes, we're sunk. And Jesus told us the very first thing to pray for, to honor God, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then what is the first thing we actually ask for? Thy kingdom, your government, come. That's what we're to be praying for. That's what we're to be working for. That's what we're to be preparing for. 
And that's one of the most important aspects of the whole gospel is right government. It really is, and we deeply, deeply need to understand that, brethren, and how it affects our whole way of life. So I hope that you will understand that and the importance of right government and the blessings. And that is my title today, The Blessings of God's Government. And a lot of people think God's government is a curse, so they're going to tell us what to do. Well, God is going to tell me what to do throughout all eternity. And I'm glad for him to do that. And I hope you feel the same way. And if you don't, that you will get to where you do want God to tell you what to do. You do want to learn the way of God, the law of God, the way of life that will get you into eternal life and give you happiness and give your family happiness and give the whole American peoples and all the nations of the earth happiness throughout all eternity. The homosexuals think they can be happy by using each other's body in a perverse manner. Maybe they can get a certain sexual release in that way. So they're just willing to change everything to do that and even redefine marriage as to what marriage is. Is the purpose of marriage that one thing? No. The purpose of marriage is to build a strong family. And the family is a type of God. It's a type of the kingdom of God, the family of God. And so with these homosexuals, if they achieve their ultimate goal, where everybody would be like that, then where would we be? There wouldn't be anyone. The human race would become extinct because of their selfishness, focusing. You see what I mean when you think about here's what I want and what I would like to see in the next few years or even the next few decades. That is not the total answer. The total answer is what would be best for the whole world and all the people in the world from now on. And the answer is in this book right here called the Holy Bible, which is the mind of God. And it's the revelation of the way God thinks. So God dwells on right government and so many aspects of it all the way through the Bible. And we're commanded to preach the gospel of the kingdom to all the nations. And then the end will come. So we do need to realize the importance of that and prepare to learn and to practice right government. That's part of our job. And turn to Revelation 2, if you would. I'm going to skim over some of these early things we've covered many times, but still for anyone new in our church, some of you younger people listen. Sometimes we say, you all know that. They say, no, we don't know that. Okay, let's start here. What's our goal? What are we supposed to be preparing for? Revelation 2, verses 26 and 7. Jesus is talking, and he overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him will I give power over the nations, obviously carnal nations of this world. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He's not just over perfect angels up in heaven. The saint who overcomes is going to be over carnal, rebellious nations of this earth, rebellious at first at least, as the potter's vessels shall be broken in pieces as I also received from my father. So Christ was given that same authority to rule powerfully, certainly at first to wake people up over the nations here on earth. Revelation 5, in verse 8, it talks about the prayers of the saints. And verse 9, Revelation 5, verse 9, the saints sang a new song saying, you, speaking of Christ, are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals for you, Christ, were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Not up in heaven, as Mr. Ames has brought out in his fine exhaustive research into prophecy, and I'm sure he's planning to preach on the book of Revelation. <laughs> he's telling us to study the book of Revelation. But he's been researching prophecy in a very special way. And so we do go to heaven for the wedding feast, the wedding, and perhaps the wedding supper also, but we don't stay up there. We come right back down to the earth, and we are going to reign for the next 1,100 years on this earth. And that's what the Bible says that our calling is to be. And I think most of us know that. So that's our calling. That's what we're prepared to do, to be rulers. Each of us needs to think about being a ruler in the right way. And we heard in the sermon that to make right judgments. And that is certainly an important part of being a, a right ruler, a good ruler, and very important. Turn back to 1 Corinthians, if you would, at this time, and chapter 6. 
Here's another old chestnut, as they say, a basic thing about the government of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? How dare you go to some outside court when God's own servants who are training to be governors and kings forever are sitting right here? Paul is asking the brethren that under God's inspiration. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? That's what we're called to do. And he says, and if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters, just human things in this world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things concerning to this life, do you appoint, or sometimes it's translated because the implication is here, why do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church? Why do you go to outsiders who aren't even converted and ask them to judge you, who they who don't even claim to be Christians in many cases, they don't who have the mind of God at all, for we're training to be kings and priests in God's kingdom. Back in chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1, he describes this man who is having sex, and he says, He's going to put him out of the church. In verse 3, he says, I indeed is absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present concerning this deed. In the name of Christ, when you're gathered together along with my spirit, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ delivers such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. They were going along thinking everything's fine. And if this great big pile of sin sitting right in their middle, they were not willing to deal with. God does not want us to have that kind of thing right in our middle. We shall not, we must not, with God's help. Sometimes we have to make decisions that are not popular, and that's too bad. All of us need to understand the fear of God. All of us need to realize that Christ is in charge, and he guided Paul to make this decision, and Paul told them that before he even got there. He got the basic facts, undoubtedly, from other elders that he trusted. He knew that it was true. This man was doing something very clearly bad. He put him out based on that even before. He didn't have some great big, uh, you know, uh, court hearing or something like that, just based on the basic facts as God's servant, and God guided him to do that. That is put in here uh, as an example. Think, brethren, please. God will not give any of you or me a tremendous responsibility as a king or a priest over five cities or ten cities, maybe a whole planet. He's not going to give us that kind of responsibility unless we are tried and tested and tested and tried and God knows where we stand, that we are completely conquered by God that we're willing to follow what God says, and yes, what God says clearly through his church. And that's part of it. That's part of the vehicle that God is using today to teach us lessons for all eternity. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that involved the church. They were to carry out that responsibility of judging even physical matters and upsets and problems between the brethren. So we do have that responsibility, and you have to think about it. What is the benefit of church government? The benefit of church government is that it teaches us a way of life which is going to help us forever, personally even, and it's going to help God know where we will end up throughout all eternity. And so it is a very great benefit. In the meantime, correct church government will keep us together in unity. It will help the church to grow more to the extent that's carried out, to the extent that people respond to that government. And that's all very important. Some people in the church said, well, you made a mistake. Yes, we made a mistake. Paul made a mistake. Peter made a mistake. Paul got right in Peter's face when Peter would not have be willing to eat with the Gentiles on that occasion after that was shown to be all right. But that didn't mean the government of God was wrong. God began to straighten it out right away. And the obvious implication is what? That Peter backed down. He never came back to Paul on that. You don't find there was some great big confrontation. Peter took the correction. We're to submit to one another. 
and they went on from there. And Paul was used to be one of the most powerful servants of God in history, and so was Peter. And they carried on. And in the last chapter of the last letter Peter wrote, he talks about our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has written and so on. So he loved Paul, even though he was corrected by Paul. God guides his servants. They will sometimes make short-term mistakes, but God will straighten them out. Mr. Armstrong made quite a number of short-term mistakes. He allowed us to have a wrong understanding of divorce and remarriage. And frankly, brethren, and I say this before God, that was the most awful thing that I had to do as a minister because I was over the churches for about 12 years and I had to have meetings about twice a month on all day Sunday or Sunday afternoon or whatever, having other men with me and going over these DNR cases, divorce and remarriage cases. What a mess. It hurt. Some people had to be broken up and they'd had a second or third marriage but in that second marriage or third marriage, they had beautiful little children, and they broke down and cried, bawled right in front of my eyes when we had to tell them that they were not bound to this other mate because they had an original mate back here. Mr. Armstrong allowed that to go on, and it was brought to him two or three times. It took him a few years to back down on that, but he did. He counted Pentecost wrong, and he kept on. And finally, Mr. Raymond Manera went to him about it, a couple of young smart aleks came in a wrong attitude, and he spotted their attitude, so he did not back down. But when Raymond came humbly and continually, Raymond was a very patient person. He kept coming, kept coming, kept coming. Then Mr. Armstrong saw it. But even then, he checked up one last time on that word, which means from, because Mr. Armstrong used to explain powerfully. I know Mr. Davis and Mrs. Party, and I'm sure is here, and other old members may remember how Mr. Armstrong said, 50 uh, feet from this desk, doesn't mean starting one foot back inside the desk. 50 feet from means a way out of. You know, that's the way we normally count from. He finally decided to call someone he knew would be neutral in the sense they were not pretending to be any kind of Christian, but they understood the Hebrew. That was Dr. Mazar's daughter, whom he got to know pretty well during the dig, we called it, the archaeological project. And she, by this time, was a grown woman, maybe 40 or 45 years old. She was teaching the Hebrew language. That was her skill for non-Hebrew-speaking people, Americans over there and so on. He said to her, Mrs. Mazar, or Miss, whatever she was then, he said, how would you interpret this? Does it mean, when you say from, does it mean a way out of, and he explained, or does it mean you can count with the very first foot inside? She said, I see what you mean, Mr. Armstrong, but she says the Hebrew language is unusual, and it does mean starting with. So when you count 50 days from the weekly Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread, you don't start counting with the next day, you start counting with that first Sabbath. If you're following me in your mind, you older brethren know what I'm talking about because they used to keep Pentecost on Monday. He thought you had to start by counting on the Sunday, you see, not on the weekly Sabbath. But when you count from that weekly Sabbath, and that weekly Sabbath is day one, then where are you? Well, then, of course, you come to the 49th day is seven Sabbaths later on a Sabbath, and then the 50th day, Pentecost means literally 50th, the 50th day then falls on when? On Sunday. So God does command us to keep one Sunday a year, <laughs> not every Sunday. He does command us to keep one Sunday a year holy, the day of Pentecost. And when Mr. Armstrong had all this other proof and that too, then he backed down, and he changed. And there are quite a few times when he would change. Yes, he made some mistakes. But what was happening? Why did I stay with Mr. Armstrong? I sent that he might be wrong on that. I really did, and on DNR. And Raymond certainly did, who was one of my best friends during those years, and we talked about it. How come we stayed with him? Three reasons. Most of all, of course, the fear of God. <laughs> But technically speaking, we stayed with Mr. Armstrong because he was still preaching the whole truth of God, the whole way of God, except that one technical point. He did preach the holy days. That's how we learned about them in the first place. 
He had us keep them. He understood the meaning of it. He just got that one technical point wrong, how to count it. Secondly, he was still doing the work of God. That work was being done very powerfully. And thirdly, he was, of course, administering overall the government of God in a correct manner, not perfectly. You say, well, none of you administer it perfectly. You better believe it. No one has ever preached the gospel perfectly. No one has ever done the work of God perfectly. No one has ever administered the government of God perfectly except one. His name was Jesus of Nazareth. He did do it perfectly. But as long as the church of God, this church, which most of you know is the one doing most of the work, and we're closer to the truth than the others, as long as you realize that, and you know that's important, and that is vitally important, these three things, then you'd better stay here, even if you think we're making some technical mistake about counting something, or about some other technical point, or someone is being dealt with and you don't understand it. Why don't you understand it every time we put someone out? We've had to put people, ministers, out of the church at times, and why don't we tell you every detail of it? Well, it's not supposed to be. I could say it's none of your business, <laughs> frankly. But if I tell you every detail of some human problem, perhaps drinking problem, sex problem, or maybe even just a completely wrong attitude, a rebellious problem, that shouldn't be necessary. We don't want to lay it all out before the brethren. We're not in some worldly, you know, court situation. You have to have a certain degree of trust in one thing, that Jesus Christ, as the Bible tells us three or four times, Christ is the living head of the church of God. People say of the various branches of the church, we're all the same, we're all the same. Brethren, we are not all the same. The three big things that differentiate us is that we are preaching more of the truth, we're doing the work far more powerfully with the resources that we have, and thirdly, which most of them don't do at all, we are practicing the government of God. There are two guys out there that are even more strict than we are, and most of you know about them, but some of you don't, but I'm not worried about you going if you have your head on straight, as we say, because they are absolute ridiculous. They are, they, are, they are little Hitlers, and if you disagree with them, they'll just, they don't even discuss it. They just kick you right out. They become little dictators, and they have immediately promoted themselves to be prophets or apostles. I was their Bible teacher. I've been in the church years and decades longer than those two fellows. I have not promoted myself to be a prophet. I have not promoted myself to be an apostle, and I don't intend to. If God ever wants me to be an apostle, he will do great miracles through me. The work will grow even more powerfully, and there will be more of the signs of an apostle that are not there to that extent yet. I don't want to promote myself to anything, and I hope all of you feel the same way. We're far better off. He who humbles himself will be abased, and he who exalts himself will be humbled. And Jesus said that. That's in the book of Proverbs over and over again, that basic lesson. So we do need to understand, though, that we are different from these other churches. The correct understanding and practice of the government of God is absolutely vital. It is a very important part of the gospel because the whole gospel tells us to preach the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is the government of God. And the government of God ought to be understood and it ought to be taught and practiced within the church as we find so many examples of it in the New Testament. So again, God is not going to give any of us awesome power as a full member of the family of God unless we have been tested, unless we are willing to show God by our fruits, by our words, by our actions, by everything we do that we are submissive to his government and his church today. And then he will understand by that that we will be willing to be submissive to his government in tomorrow's world. That's one of the tests all of us have to have. You say, well, you're in charge. That's easy for you to say. Well, I don't want to brag again because I could start and tell you big stories about it. I've told you some of these things, but I've been tested on that probably more than any of you here. And many of our older ministers have told me that. They know that. 
I had to go through being put down and kicked and stopped and accused of this and that for years, and then later it was back down and usually admit it was wrong later. But I had to trust that God was behind it, and he allowed it to teach me lessons for all eternity. Are you willing to learn lessons for all eternity? I hope you are. If you are not, you'll find some mistake we made, or else you will think you found a mistake, which you really didn't, but you'll think that, and then that, you'll use that as the vehicle, the excuse to begin to mutter. Think about it as you read through the Old Testament. Most of you have been in church a number of years. You remember all the way through the, the Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the murmurings of the people of Israel, the murmurings. Well, you know, I don't agree with this. Well, they're over there doing this. And well, we disagree with that. Blah, 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 blah. What happened to those murmurers in most cases? God dealt with them powerfully. I remember names of even leading ministers that I could recite to you who got to doing that, murmuring against Mr. Armstrong, murmuring against the leadership of the church, and where are they? And I don't want to tell you their names. I'm tempted to because I like to use name. It makes it more official somehow <laughs> so you can know exactly who I'm talking about. But it's not right. Some of these men are still alive and some are dead. But I know Mr. Apartheid could tell you about a lot of them. He understood the same way I do. And Mr. Ames would remember some of them and Dr. Germano and other uh, Mrs. Apartheid and other people go way back who they were. Some murmurers began to accuse Mr. Apartheid of various things and got the French work divided, and he was put out of the French work for a while. Later, what happened to them? He was put back over the French work. When they were put over the French work, what did Mr. Apartheid do? Did he leave the church? No. He stayed in the church. He still honored Mr. Armstrong, and he waited on God then what did God do? God tested him for a year or two and then put him right back over the French work again. We're being tested, brethren. The test may not last two hours. It might last two years. <laughs> so you think about it. Be willing to work within the work of God and understand how Christ is the living head of the church, but he uses it as a vehicle to teach us lessons. Turn now, if you would now, to Ephesians. Let's turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2, if you would. In Ephesians, and I'm going to be in reading in chapter 2 and verse 19, Paul writing to these Gentiles at Ephesus, he says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation. Brethren, what is our foundation? Having been built on the foundation of the apostles, what kind of government, what kind of organizational structure did they have? Most of you know that. You know that Christ, I think it's in, in Luke 6, verse 12, he appointed them. He didn't have a board voting for it. He appointed them. You find in the book of Titus, chapter 1, how Paul sent Titus to, to straighten out things in Crete. He didn't say, I got the board's permission. He used him, and he sent him to do that, instructed him to do that. All through the New Testament, you see the constant, constant, completely consistent example of government from the top down, through the apostles, through the evangelists, right back down through the church. Having him built, what's in the example in the Old Testament? The prophets. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He's the ultimate example. Who was the God of the Old Testament? Again, most of you know where I'm going. It was Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it describes that rock that guided ancient Israel. And 1 Corinthians, if you're writing, chapter 10, verse 4, that rock was Christ. Many scriptures show that. Christ was the God of the Old Testament. He's the one who told them to appoint people. He's the one to set judges in Israel. He's the one who has set captains over thousands and, and hundreds and fifties and tens. It was Christ doing all of that. That's where it all comes from, Christ acting for God the Father. 
Christ being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. So we are being built together for a dwelling place for God's Holy Spirit. So we want to be sensitive to God's will. Now some of these people in these other Church of God groups are nice people. They're not evil people. They're nice people but they say, well, what will the people want? So they kind of compromise and they water down here and they water down there in various ways and they go along with that kind of thing and they vote and they pose and they politic and it's not right. We are different from them. Yes, we are. Don't ever forget that, brethren. We're different from the way in their way in preaching many points of the full truth they don't preach and in certainly doing the work more fully and concentrating on that and doing far more with what we have to do with than any group on earth. And thirdly, or perhaps alone, in practicing the correct form of the government of God, not as a couple of dictators are out there yelling at people and threatening them, or as the other people who vote in politic. In between, we're having appointments, and I appoint Mr. Ames over certain things, and I've appointed other evangelists and various things, and then they appoint others under them, and we work in that way just exactly like you find in the New Testament. And that is the government of God, as you find in the Old Testament and as you find in the New Testament. And that's the way it should be. So anyway, we're practicing what is there. That is the pattern. And Christ is the ultimate cornerstone of that whole system. Now back here in chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 speaks of the greatness of God's power in verse 19 according to the work of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1, now verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in that which is to come. Christ has given a magnificent job. The ruler of the universe only under God the Father, the greatest name in the universe, and we're to worship Him, we're to adore Him, we're to imitate Him, we're to want to have His mind in everything we think and say and do. We want to follow His form of church government, which He guided when He was the God of Israel, which He magnified and followed in the New Testament through His apostles. That's the mind of God. That's Christianity. That's what Jesus Christ did do. And so He goes on here, and he, God, put all things under his, Christ's feet, and gave him, Christ, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we are the body. Christ is the living head. He guides us. Christ is not on the earth anymore. He speaks through my mouth. He speaks through Mr. Ames' mouth. He speaks through other mouths of his servants around the world. We collectively are his body. And he uses our bodies collectively in many ways to get his message out. And he's working with us, teaching us, fashioning and molding us. And we, the ministry, are trying to help all of you constantly to grow in grace and in knowledge so you can be kings and priests. You can be over a whole planet, maybe a whole who knows, galaxy someday. The end of his kingdom, there is no end. Of the increase of his kingdom, there is no end, it tells us. It's awesome when you think about it, what God has in mind for us. If we today are willing to humble ourselves, to be sensitive to God's will, and to say, all right, we're going to really submit to Christ's government in his church today, knowing that will prepare us for a high position in God's church in tomorrow's world. And that is extremely important. Now let's go back to Exodus 16 or Exodus 18. And I'll cover this quickly because this is very fundamental. And I've often done that in sermons along this line. But I don't want to leave it out. Remember the example, brethren, in Exodus 18. When Moses was first put over the peoples of Israel and was teaching them God's laws. His father-in-law came and as he saw Moses judging the people, verse 13, it says in verse 13, Exodus 18, 13, 
the people stood before Moses from morning till evening. Great long lines of people. And Moses was talking to them and trying to sort out Farmer Jones' cow jumped into Farmer Smith's vegetable patch and tore it up or ate it up. And they had various arguments and disputes of over the boundaries of their property or, you know, whatever it was. And Moses was dealing with all of that. And his father-in-law was perceptive. And God, you can see, guided his father-in-law to come there and gave him as an older man advice. And by the example of the way it came out, you could see God guided it and Moses listened to his advice. He said, look, you're going to wear yourself out. He said, you just need to teach people God's statutes and his laws, verse 16, and it, what you're doing is not good. You're going to wear yourself out trying to handle every single case. He said in verse 19, you listen to me and I'll tell you what to do. He says, you teach the people and to teach them to bring their difficulties to God. And verse 20, you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and how the, show them the way in which they must walk Moreover, verse 21, here's the first example of delegation and a form of government mentioned in the Bible. Here it is. Moreover, you shall select. You're not to vote. You, Moses, are to appoint or select capable men from among the people, such as fear God. That's the first qualification. Men who have an awe of God. You really want to do what God says. That's the first thing. Not smart like, well, here's what I think. Well, I don't like this. So-and-so hurt my feelings, so I'm out of here. Blah, blah, blah. No, that's not it. Men who say, I know that God is real. I know this is the church. I know that he will guide the church. I know that he has put, you know, Dr. Nail over the church administration and Dr. Jemina over the college. I know that he has put whoever over the various jobs around here. He's put Mr. Dexter Wakefield as business, overall business supervisor, and Mr. Ruddleson as controller in the business office. Of run. And so I'm going to leave that up to God. I'm not to argue about those things. If I'm treated here wrongly, I'll go and tell them about it, but I'm not going to try to overthrow everything. They fear God. They recognize God is involved. Men of truth, men that really try to do the truth and understand the truth, hating covetousness, men that do not try to rake off money to take for themselves and place those kind of men over the people to be rulers. And of course, we know the way it was carried out. They were to be, in a sense, just like Samuel later and like Moses. They were to be, in effect, a judge and a priest at the same time. They were to teach the truth, but they were to make decisions. And they were to be the overall leader, rulers, as it says here, uh, 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 hated covetousness, placed them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And the commentaries and the Hebrew even references indicate, which I think is correct when you see the examples of it, it wasn't ten men that some man was put over, it was ten families. The men represented the families. So they were big families, and this one ruler of ten may have had 40 or 80 people. You know, my first wife's uh, family had eight children. Carl McNair had seven siblings. They were eight children, so the family had 10. And if all the families had 10, and he was over 10, then he'd be over 100 people counting the children, if you follow me. So men were put in charge of this and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they'll bring to you but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will be with you, and so forth. And then it shows how Moses did do that, and God blessed Israel, and it worked out for good, and is put in here for us today as part of the mind of God. That's the kind of government that he had in motion then, and the same pattern we should carry out today. God guided Mr. Armstrong. No one appointed Mr. Armstrong an apostle. Mr. Armstrong just began to work among the Sardis people, and a number of the elders there finally ordained him as an elder, and he was never made, you know, an official apostle in the way we think of it, or an evangelist, but he was ordained an elder. But then he was shown by God, by the fruits, to have raised up a great work and he did have a lot of unusual miracles in the early days. 
and Dr. Herman Hay at the Feast of Tabernacles in 1952 at, at Sigler Springs in Northern California told the brethren, he said, brethren, he said, many of you have felt that Mr. Armstrong was a prophet, which some of them had. And then he said, and of course he was not Dr. Hay, yet he was just Mr. Hay. He said, Herbert Armstrong is not a prophet. I was sitting right behind me. I noticed Mr. Armstrong, came. was Herman going to attack me? He thought, Herbert Armstrong is not a prophet. He is an apostle. And then Mr. Hay began to explain how this, that they was, was the biggest and the most rapidly growing church of God in modern times, and how also Mr. Armstrong had had quite a number of very unusual miracles and healings, which many of us were familiar with. And so he said he has the fruits of an apostle. And Mr. Armstrong got up afterward, and I wasn't sure he was going to throw Herman off the stage. He strode briskly up there, and he said, Mr. I'm not... Wasn't, didn't know what Mr. Hay was going to say. He said, maybe he's right. I thought at first he was saying something bad, but he said, we just have to wait, brethren. Please don't go around and announce that I'm an apostle. I'm not really sure. Let's see how the fruits stack up and think about it, pray about it. And if that's what Christ is doing, then we'll go by that. But he never did emphasize that for several years until some younger men began to kind of push against him. Then he realized and many of us did. Yes, he was an apostle. I was ordained an evangelist by Mr. Herbert Armstrong 60 years ago this month. So I've been around for a while, longer than any of the other older ministers anywhere, whether you name United or Cogworth, these other groups. No one else has a leader that has gone back as far or has had as high an office or as much training directly for Mr. Armstrong as I have. Does that make me Mr. Perfect? My wife will be shaking her head. <laughs> no, that does not make me Mr. Perfect. I know that. I've got to be responsible for the knowledge God has given me. But at least I hope that you can have a certain confidence that I have spent more hundreds of hours with Mr. Armstrong, had longer training, and if I was going to do some crazy thing in 60 years, 60 solid years of the ministry, I think I would have started to do it by now. <laughs> so you have a human leader who's been a while, around a while. You have Mr. Ames who's been very dedicated and serving God and was ordained back, I don't know the date I should get that, but about 1965. So he's been around a long, long time too. And Dr. O'Neill and others who've been very dedicated, very faithful. One of our most faithful longtime ministers is Mr. Gerald Weston running our church up in Oric, up in... Uh, Oh, up in Canada, and uh, I think I'm in Pasadena again. It's up north of Missouri, <laughs> but he's very faithful. It goes back a long time with a lot of training and longer than most of the other regional pastors, and we think of him very, very highly, one of our greatest leaders in the church today, Mr. Gerald Weston. We've been through a lot. We've had a lot of ups and downs, but overall, God has guided us, used us, and he is now using us to do a powerful work and I hope you brethren can respect the fact that you have the leaders that have been used more and more powerfully and more consistently over a longer period of time than any other group on earth. And you can look at the fruits of what we are being done. We're going to have this wonderful 20th anniversary celebration coming up, and we'll talk about it some then. But I hope we can rejoice in that and yet think about what has Christ done and how is he involved. So Christ guided this form of church government way back when. Now turn to Deuteronomy 16, if you would. Deuteronomy, brethren, uh, chapter 16. And here you find in verse 13, we often read part of this in connection with the feast offerings. I'm sorry, begin in, begin in verse 18, I mean. Verse 18, right after the, the offerings for the feast, God tells them, you shall appoint, not vote for, not have, the, not have some committee do, but you shall appoint judges and officers and all your gates which the eternal your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. Yes, we are to have right judgment. You shall not show partiality nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the word of the righteous. So we are to be fair and right. And as I've known Dr. Hay and I've known Dr. Uh, Wedden Hale, I mean, 
and Dr. Uh, Ames, I call him, uh, Mr. Ames, for a long time. And both of them have been fair and just, not perfect, and I'm not perfect, but been stable and dedicated. Mr. Weston's been in the ministry going way back to the mid-50s, and he has been very stable and dedicated all those years. So it's good to understand the pattern there, and God told them to appoint judges and officers, and they were to have righteous judgment. Then in verse 17, or chapter 17, brethren, turn there with me if you would here. Now we're in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 8. He says, after telling about how they were to stone someone if they did this or that, he said, if a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge between degrees of blood guiltiness, he's speaking to the local judges here and priests, between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy within your gates, and sometimes we have that, we have to put someone out if they've been a continual drunkard or adulterer or if they're causing division or getting at people and hurting people in the church in various ways. Then you shall arise and go up to the place which the Lord your God chooses and you shall come to the priest and the Levite and to the judge there in those days and inquire of them and they shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. Now, brethren, that place today, it really is, and I think most of you know where I'm going, and I hope you can respect that. Where is the gospel going out today more powerfully from what city? Where is the work being done more powerfully? Where is more of the full truth of God going out more? From this city right here and this church and from the leading evangelists and pastors and teachers right here. And when we make a decision... Nearly every time we have several, normally, as our men know, I have a regular, not council of elders, meeting two or three times a year, but almost every week I have the executive lunch, we call it, and the top men, most of them, we can't have them all there every time we alternate some, but we'll have right around my table, it only seats eight, I got it from six to eight, I'm afraid to add too many more, there won't be room in the room. <laughs> but anyway, we have Mr. Ames, and we have Dr. Winnale, and we have Mr. Dexter Wakefield, and we'll have Mr. Hernandez, and we will have Mr. Wyatt Saselka, and we will have my son Jim, and we will have one or two others, Mr. Rod McNair. The top ones in general, one or two might be alternated, but I have seven key advisors sitting right there, and we talk over these things, and with multitude of counsel, then we'll make decisions. If it's a major really major church policy or some huge thing we're doing in the work to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, even tens of millions, then we'll talk to the entire council of elders. We'll have 14 or 15 of us because one or two others sit in beside the 14 men on the council. So we have multitude of council. We try to find God's will. We don't just leap and say, we're mad at so-and-so, we're going to kick him out. We talk about things quite a bit when we need to, or we're going to buy this big thing and we're going to go on this big station, or we're going to go on the whole network here or something like that. We get multitude of counsel. But if you come to us, and humanly speaking, I am the judge in those days. I'm not bragging. I've told you before, I don't know how long I'll be here. I think I'll be here another three to six years. I'm, apparently, I'm my, my uh, endocrinologist said, he thought I would probably live on another five or six years. So I probably will if I take care of myself. But I know I have to walk in the fear of God because I might not. But however that turns out, I want to help all of you while I'm here to be in God's kingdom. And you need to have the realization that, yes, God has guided some of us for decades. And we may make mistakes. But overall, with the attitude we've shown Christ, hopefully now, for 60 years or 40 years or whoever you're talking about, he's going to use us and guide us in his way. And we will do, make the right decisions. And so they shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment and you shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in that place which the eternal chooses and you shall be careful to do according to all that they, have, that they order you. That's what God said here. 
Verse 12, now the man who acts presumptuously and will not heed the priest who stands to minister there before the eternal your God or the judge, that man shall die. Well, he's not going to, no one's going to kill him today, but that's what God thought. It was a terrible thing to just directly reject the one that God had set over his work at that time, and they did not have God's spirit to the degree we have it today, and that's made very plain. So you shall put away the evil person from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and no longer act presumptuously. And brethren, I want to tell you, we have had people in some local churches when we've made changes out there or they've heard about changes, they get together in each other's home. Well, we don't know what those guys in, over in Charlotte are doing and we don't trust them and we've got to decide what our people want and blah, blah, blah. We've had people right here in various departments say, well, you know, we don't like so-and-so or we don't trust so-and-so and they get together in little cliques and they talk and they talk and they talk and they murmur. And God tells you through the whole Bible, the murmurers were not the ones that got into the promised land. They were the ones that died along the way. And the murmurers today, I hope a few are, are not among them, but some of you are, that you will repent and stop murmuring. Stop judging God's ministers that he's used for decades in his work. You're going to hurt yourself terribly by doing that. God help you to understand and to wake up. I'm just trying to defend myself. No, I'm an old man, 82 years old, and I may not be here next year or two years from now. I'm just telling you before God and the fear of God, for your good, please understand what I'm saying. If you develop the constant habit of judging and try to second guess every decision without knowing all the facts, and you usually don't know all the facts, you're hurting yourself terribly, and you're hurting your eternal life. You either will not be there at all if you keep it up, but if you grow and sort of water it down or quit it and cut back on it, you may be there, but you will never have the degree of great reward, which is not just a matter of blowing the trumpet and being a big shot, but the opportunity, the wonderful blessing of being able to help the whole city have peace and joy and prosperity, or maybe, as I've said, a whole planet of millions or hundreds of millions of human beings in tomorrow's world and over into the great white throne judgment and maybe others way out into eternity, you won't have that same reward if you are known by God to be those who sit on the sidelines and judge and pick and pick and pick at what Christ is doing through his call to chosen ministers. Don't do that. May God help you to wake up, you who may be doing that. You're hurting yourself terribly. I hope you know I've been around for a while. That doesn't make me perfect. I'm just saying you're hearing from an old man who's trying to give you something to help you before you go into the lake of fire or before you lose part of your reward and you'll never gain it back unless you better repent of that approach. God hates that approach. I don't have time to read all the scriptures to telling about that, but frankly, it's very, very serious. My next scripture here was number 16. I maybe shouldn't read all of that. I'll just tell you about it. In number 16, you read about the rebellion back there of these pen, again, who are trying to judge and criticize uh, God's servants. I'm trying to see my own markers here. In Numbers chapter 16, it talks about the rebellion of Korah. And most of you are familiar with that, so I don't necessarily have to read you every word. Numbers 16, 1. Now Korah, the son of Itzar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. So he was a Levite coming right down from Levi, a very capable man. This, and he's on, and he's sons of Reuben. They took men, these other men with him, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. Notice this, brethren, this rebellion. They rose up with 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown, were these oddballs over on the side here? No, they were some of the most leading men in the whole nation. 250 of them. Did God worry about them and try to placate them? No, he swallowed them up. 
they went down in the pit, they and their families, and screamed as the earth swallowed them up. You hear the roar of their voices coming up. God said, no more of that rebellion against my servant Moses. They tried to put Moses down and Aaron, and they said, you take, you take too much to yourselves. You're telling us too much to do. And they had that kind of a smart -like attitude. So brethren, God showed there powerfully how he feels about people that are muttering, that are willing to rise up against God's servant. God's servant, Mr. Armstrong, made some serious mistakes, as I've made mistakes. And we had about 30 ministers and 3,000 brethren fall away. Some of you older brethren remembered back in the late winter, early spring of 1974, led by a man named Ken Westby back here. And we found, interestingly, that the ones who held the churches together the most were not the ambassador graduates. Some of them are very good. I'm one of them, Mr. Ames, Dr. Winnell, although it's important. But the ones who actually held the church together the most back here on the East Coast were the local elders. Some of the young hot sots who came out from the college, they never had to give up a job to keep the Sabbath. They never had time to have children up in their teens or 20s or grown children and learn those lessons you learn from working with your children over decades. They hadn't learned those lessons yet. And they were, these other young hot shots were smart aleck. And they had their beer big keg and they had their hogs as they called them or Harley Davidson motorcycles and roared around in their black jackets. I got on their case one time before I was kicked out. They got that back to Mr. Armstrong in a wrong way. When I landed on them, they were telling semi-dirty and sometimes directly dirty jokes. And I corrected them strongly for that, that very spring. And later, after I was put out as director of the ministry for a while, then the next guy had to deal with them. And Mr. Armstrong found that a whole bunch of them led by that very group rose up against him and tried to kick him out. And they did. They took with them 3,000 brethren, 30 men of renown, leading ministers of the work of God. Some of them were regional pastors. That happened. Could that happen under Mr. Armstrong? Yes. It did happen under Mr. Armstrong, and a number of things like that happened through the years. It happened to the God's servant Moses. But God is not pleased with those who fight his government and begin to murmur and judge and complain and whine around, well, we wish you'd done this way, and second guess and sort of subtly twist and twist and turn or put down the ones that Almighty God is using. So please understand that, brethren. That is not the way to have a good reward in the kingdom of God. It just isn't. And we must learn that lesson for all eternity. So Christ is responsible to guide the offices in his ministry. He's in charge. He is the living head, and I hope we understand that. Turn, if you would. I think I read this. I'm afraid I skipped over this, didn't I? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. And I'm going to be reading here uh, verses 22 and 23 where it says here that God put Christ far above all principality and power and every name that is named. And he put all things under his Christ's feet. Yes, I did read that. And gave him to be the head. Christ was put, or God put Christ all, uh, uh, Christ over all things in the church to be the head over all things to the church. So Christ is put over the building program. Christ is put over the summer camp. Christ is put over the ministry. Christ is put over editorial. Christ is put over television. Christ is put over internet. He's in charge over all. God put him in charge over all things to the church which is his body. So we do need to understand that and really respect that. So, but I want to put in this one thing. Mr. Armstrong used to do this, but near the end of his life, he forgot to do it, and that was sad. Maybe God guided that for a reason. But he would say, brethren, if I turn aside, and I will tell you, if I turn aside like Mr. Tkach did and teach a totally wrong gospel and teach against the laws of God, 
and that the gospel of the kingdom of God is not important and Christ is not coming back setting up a government here on this earth or things that are basic like they did, doing away with those basic things, the Sabbath, the holy days, everything like that. If I or Mr. Ames or anyone turn aside in those basic ways, then I would urge you to do what all of us did do. You know what I mean? We would leave worldwide and we would go somewhere else. We would have to find where is the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day and see where God is working. But as long as we are still doing the work of God overall and as long as we are preaching the full truth overall, not perfectly, no one's ever done it except Christ <laughs> and they crucified him. They didn't think he was doing it perfectly either, of course. And as long as we're practicing the government of God overall, you'd better stay put and honor what Christ is doing. And that's a very important thing to understand. It really is. If you turn now to Second Chronicles here in your Old Testament, this is Second Chronicles, uh, brethren. Let's see if I can turn here quickly. I want to turn to Second Chronicles talking about Jehoshaphat, the very righteous king of Israel. Uh, can you hear me now? Okay. It's coming through this, the mic. This is Second Chronicles chapter 19, chapter 19, verse 4. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, a very righteous king, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the mountains of Ephraim and brought them back. They were falling away. He brought them back to the way of God. Then he set judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and then he said to the judges, Again, brethren, this must be God's will or it wouldn't be in the Bible. So he said to the judges, and it's shown to be right, take heed what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the eternal who will be with you in the judgment. So God will guide us in the judgment. He promises that in many different ways in the Bible. So don't just think we do it all apart from Christ. No, Christ is responsible to guide us over all in those things. He is, as I said, the living head of the church of God. So turn back here then to uh, Hebrews chapter 13, if you would. Hebrews chapter 13, near the end of your New Testament. Hebrews chapter 13, and near the end of the whole New Testament, God inspired Paul to write verse 7. Remember those who have, who have the rule over you. Yes, we're in charge of the spiritual matters, at least in the church, who have spoken the word of God to you. I have spoken the word of God to God's people for more than any of the other ministers in that way for 60 years, whose faith follow. That doesn't mean you follow every one of my peculiarities because I make little mistakes all kinds of mistakes, but you follow my faith, my basic approach to God, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. When we had one leading minister back in Pasadena who left and had a lot of personal sins, well, don't follow his conduct if they've had a very ungodly conduct. But I have human nature, but I haven't jumped away in that way, as most of you know. Follow their conduct. And then he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he is the ultimate example. Follow their example. And then remember, Christ is the ultimate example. Follow them as they follow Christ. But follow them. Have honor for that office. Then he says down in verse 17, Obey those. Yes, do what we say. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as though they must give account. Let them do it with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So don't fight and resist the ministry. Be grateful that all of us together, brethren, in this extended family, and you brethren seeing this later on the tape out there in various cities around the world, we're all one extended family. God somehow has called us all out from a different type of background, each one of us, but he's working with us. He's fashioning and molding us. He's making us into the kind of characters to be in his kingdom forever. He needs to know where we stand 
He needs to know that we have the fear of God. He needs to know that we will say, not just if we're in the army, how much more if we're in God's army? Yes, sir. And respond and try to make it work. You may not always understand all the reasons behind every decision. As I said, when we put someone out of the church for drunkenness or fornication or something, is it our job to tell you all their sins? No, it is not. We're supposed to cover. You just have to have confidence that if we're doing God's work and you see the fruits of that, you'll know we had a good reason for doing what we're doing, whatever it is. Have faith that Christ is the living head of the church. And I hope all the different branches of the church finally someday come to understand that. That's one of their big weaknesses. They cannot have the right faith that Jesus Christ really is alive, that he really is the living head of the church, and then go ahead and practice various forms of government that are totally contrary to what he taught. It involves faith. It involves faith in Christ. It involves love. If you love God with all your heart and strength and mind, then you will tend to trust in God. Faith and love and hope are interchangeably joined together. So love God with all your heart. Love Jesus with all your heart. And have faith that Christ will guide his ministry, that he will guide his church and be a part of an active, loyal, enthusiastic part of a team a team that Christ is developing here as we get closer to the end. We're going to have to trust each other more. Go do this, get this done, and get this message all over the world and cooperate and work together as the team that Jesus Christ is using and as the cadre of those who will be in God's family forever. That's our reward, being full sons of God throughout all eternity because we have learned to put our total faith and trust in God.